All right, good morning. And I'm glad to be here before you through Zoom and to share the word of God with you once again and to provoke our thinking to become better servants of God, to become better uh, people of God, to be more like Jesus. Uh, remember, Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the servant. And so our goal in life is to be the greatest servant that we can be, the greatest servant to God and the greatest servant to man. And we're going to start a series of lessons. I've never preached this before, so I uh, feel special uh, that I'm going to share these lessons with you. And I titled these series of lessons, The Christian Shema. And as you look on the screen with the slide there, that is the Hebrew word. You read from right to left in Hebrew. And I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I know more about the Koine Greek language than I do about Hebrew. I can probably pronounce about maybe 20 Hebrew words. But this word here is Shema. That's how you pronounce it. That's how uh, the Hebrews pronounce it. And when we get into the series of lessons, we're going to break down this word Shema, and we'll talk about how it's the Christian Shema, and we'll talk about uh, Yahweh, the, the, the one true God. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how we are to love that one true God, and so on and so forth in these series of lessons. And so this morning, when you hear me talk about Yahweh, that's uh, the pronunciation of God's sacred name. Um, or the Tetragrammaton known as the YHWH, the Yaha, uh, Yava Heya um, in Hebrew. I probably mispronounced that, but um, we'll get into that later. I just want to uh, raise the question with you this morning, if I can, on my slides. And this is a very simple question, and I know you'll get it right, but I just want to provoke your thinking this morning. Uh, which is the greatest commandment given by Jesus? Which is the greatest commandment? And you might say, well, Brother Johns, yes, we had that in our scripture reading earlier. This is very simple. Uh, the greatest commandment is to love God first and to love mankind. And that is true. And we have that found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39. And I want us to read that together where Jesus says, this is the greatest commandment. There's no other greater commandment than this. And brethren, this applies to us as well as Christians. Even though Jesus contextually is speaking to Jews under the law, even though this is a lawyer, a professional in the law of Moses, a professional in the law of God, who knew the law, Jesus tells him the greatest commandment in the law of God is summed up in these two commandments. And this still applies to us as Christians. These commandments have not changed. And here's the greatest commandment for mankind, for us. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your mind. And notice on my slide, I have in italics and with all your strength. Matthew does not mention with all your strength like Mark mentions. And it's interesting that when Matthew records Jesus response here in the greatest commandments, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He doesn't say with all your strength. Well, we got to remember the context of the book of Matthew. Matthew is writing to Jews and his audience being Jews that he wrote to there in Judea. When Jesus quotes that passage, remember the Jews already had majority of the law memorized. And so he just quotes part of it. Matthew records part of it. But Mark mentions the rest with all your strength. And he says in verse 38, the second, or, or this is the greatest and foremost commandment. This is the greatest commandment. And verse 39, the second is like it. The second is a part of that commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's the greatest commandment. But what's interesting is when we look at Mark's gospel, Mark records something for us a little bit different. When he talks about the greatest commandment, Mark mentions the fact that, yes, the greatest commandment is to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart with all your soul and all your strength. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But Mark mentions the fact that that love for God is to love the one true God and we are to have only one God because that's what God desired in the law and that's what God desires today. That we only have one God and we love that one God and that one God is Yahweh, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we'll talk about in our later discussion. That all three persons of the Godhead take up that divine name, Yahweh, or the Tetragrammaton, the YHWH. And we'll look at that in further lessons. But I want you to notice what Mark says. 
And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing. That is Jesus rebuking the religious leaders. Contextually, he has rebuked the Pharisees. The Pharisees were, were tempting him and testing him to see um, if it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And then the scribes who didn't believe in the resurrection, he schools them on the verse on the resurrection where he says at the burning bush that God is, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so now we're going to have a scribe try to chime in now on Jesus. We learn in this chapter in Matthew 12 that this is a chapter contextually, don't try to debate with Jesus. <laughs> don't try to argue with Jesus. You'll never win the argument when it comes to religion or when it comes to everything in life. Why? Because he is the creator. And so we learn when it says here, and one of the scribes came and heard them arguing, that is Jesus putting them in their place. He wants to take a turn now and recognizing that he had answered them well, ask him, what commandment is the foremost of all? I want to know, teacher. I want to know, rabbi, you great teacher. Since you answered them correctly, can you answer this question? What is the greatest commandment of all of God's commandments? And look how Jesus responds. Jesus answered the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Notice that. He's our God is one Lord. That's a part of the greatest commandment. That we are to have one God. And this is the one God who wants us to love him with everything that we have all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, our all in all, everything that God has given us, our body, soul, and spirit, he wants to serve him and him only alone because there is only one God. And we'll talk about that later in a future lesson. And also the neighbor that we are to love is made in the image of the one true God. The neighbor that we are to love is made in the image of God, brethren. That is mankind, all of us, no matter what our ethnicity is, no matter what our gender is, we're all made in the image of the one true God, Yahweh. And how are we made in that image of God? Man is a threefold being made up of body, soul, and spirit. Three in one being. And when we look at God, when we look at the triune God, triune God, we see that God is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when God created man, he created man in his own image. He made man an intelligent being, a threefold being. And that's why we are commanded to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And if we don't love our neighbor, regardless if, if they're our enemy or not, regardless if they are wicked, regardless if they are uh, a rotten individual, by the way they behave and conduct themselves, God still wants us to love them because he loves them. And God wants us to pray for them because he cares for them. Remember when Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount to love your enemies and pray for all of them. And why? Because God is good to all. He, send, he sends the sunshine and the rain to all people. God wants all people to be saved, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. And so this neighbor that we are to love is made in the image of God. And I like what James says in James chapter 3 and verse 9, when he talks about the tongue. Contextually, the tongue there, uh, he's referring to the mind. The mind controls the tongue. And what's in our mind, we let it out of our mouth, and it causes a bunch of trouble, doesn't it? And so he says, with it, with the tongue, we bless our Lord. That's right, right? We, we, we praise God on Sunday morning. We, we praise God on Wednesday night sometimes. And throughout the week, we praise God. We sing hymns. But he says this also, and, and Father, the Lord and Father, and with it, with the tongue, guess what also we do? We curse men who have been made in the likeness or image of the one true God. Isn't that interesting? That we are guilty of this. Sometimes we get mad with that fellow man, and sometimes we get mad with those whom we disagree with, and we say things like, whoa, that person's so dumb. Well, that person's an idiot. Or, I can't believe this person did this or that. And we slip up and we say things like that. And remember what James says, these things ought not to be. Brethren, the neighbor that we are, ought, the neighbor we ought to love is made in the image of Yahweh. And God wants us to pray for our enemies and love all mankind. That's God's desire. 
And we must always remember that. You know, one quick thing while I think about this with our tongue, we praise God. We, we praise the Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men. You know, the analogy I can give behind this is think about somebody who's a Christian riding in their car singing hymns. And somebody cuts in front of them and throws them the finger and they lose their cool and stick their head out their window and say, you, you know what? We need to be very careful, brethren, because we cannot love the one true God without loving fellow man. And I would be the first to stand up here and say, I've been guilty of these things in the past. And pray to God that we do better, that we don't curse mankind who's made in the image or likeness of the one true God. And so, brethren, when we come to the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment in a nutshell is to worship the one true God, Yahweh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to love him with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And notice what Jesus says. There is no other commandment greater than these. Why? Because if you love God and you love man, you are doing the will of God. And if you love God, you're going to keep his commandments. We'll talk about that more so in a further lesson. If you're loving God, you're going to honor him and respect him. And if you're loving God, you're going to love mankind. And so these two commandments sum up the law and the prophets as Jesus talks about in Matthew's account. And these two commandments, these greatest commandments or the greatest commandment fulfills everything that God wants us to do. It's that simple. That we were just to have these two verses alone and the whole entire Bible uh, we would be okay. But then again, we wouldn't know the will of God, right? <laughs> we wouldn't know God's will uh, unless he tells us. And so we have the rest of the scriptures. We have the letters to the churches. We have letters to individuals. We have Old Testament history. And so we learn about God and how to worship God in that manner. Now, I want you to notice something here. In Mark chapter 12, Mark's account, verses 29 through 30, here Jesus says, here's the greatest commandments, or the greatest commandment. Jesus answered, the foremost is, watch this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Jesus here, brethren, is quoting from the law, and Jesus is quoting what the Hebrews or the Jewish people call today is called the Shema. And it comes from that Hebrew word Shema, which is the first word right there that we translate in English to hear. We'll come back and talk about that in great detail. But here, pay attention, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I mean, excuse me, with all your mind. Now, I want to raise this question which, with you this morning and ask you this question and pay attention to what I'm saying and listen and look at the slide. Did you notice the difference between Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, the Shema, and Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 30, in which Jesus quotes the Shema? The word mind is not in Deuteronomy. The word is not mentioned there. And so we asked the question this morning, is Jesus adding to the word of God? Is Jesus adding a word mind? Because it's not found there in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. The word soul is found there. The word heart is found there. The word strength is found there. But the word mind is not found there. And so, brethren, we know that Jesus is the eternal word. He is the word of God. He's the one who gave the word of God. He's the one who sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to inspire the apostles. And not only that, he was involved in the Old Testament before the coming of Christ being incarnate. So Jesus is not adding to the word. He's actually expounding upon the word. He's actually expounding upon the word and explaining what it means to love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And so he expounds upon the word heart. Now, I understand, and you should know, too, as a Bible student, that Jesus did not speak Koine Greek. He spoke Aramaic, which is an older form of Hebrew. But when Mark records his gospel, he's recording it in Koine Greek. So is Matthew and all the New Testament writers. And so when they mention the fact that Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength, he's expounding upon the word heart and he explains what the heart is and how that's involved in worship and how that's involved in serving God. The, the Greek word there uh, for heart is the Greek word cardia. Now, as I say cardia, you should automatically 
uh, hear that word and, and it sounds similar to an English word, cardiology. The doctor who's a professional at working on the heart, cardiologist, or cardiology is the study of the heart. Cardiologist is the specialist dealing with the heart. And so Jesus here explains what the heart is. He explains it's not just that organ in your body that pumps blood, but here's what the heart is, and here's what God wants of your heart. Mark records the, the Greek word here for uh, heart as the Greek word uh, dianoia. And what's interesting about this Greek word dianoia, the word means intellect. The word means understanding. The word means intelligence. The word uh, dianoia comes from two Greek words, dia meaning from and nous meaning mind or from the mind. So we're talking about intellect, thoughts that are built up in your mind, coming from, what the, coming from the mind. And we get the English word paranoia, <laughs> or somebody's paranoid, they're beside their mind, they're, they're beside their self, and they're thinking that everybody's after them. So we use that word paranoia. But Jesus here is talking about the heart as intellect. And we know that because look at Mark 12 and verse 33. If you'll read that with me, Mark 12 and verse 33. And this is the, the scribe or the lawyer, the professional of the law, responding back to Jesus' response. And here's what he says in verse 33. And to love him, that is love Yahweh, the one true God, with all the heart and with all the what? Understanding understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself brethren when jesus adds the word and, and i use that loosely he's not adding but when jesus talks about the mind he's expounding upon the heart that the heart that he's talking about that god is talking about he's talking about our intellect talking about our understanding. We must have an understanding on who God is if we're going to truly have one God and worship him. We must understand who God is. And brethren, when we come to know God, we must understand and we should understand that God is the Almighty. And we must understand that God sets the standard when it comes to worshiping him. So when we talk about this dianoia, we're talking about an understanding of who God is and how he wants to be worshiped. God is eternal. There is no beginning with God. He always existed. And you try to think about that. You try to wrap your mind around that. You'll lose your mind. <laughs> Before I became a Christian and before I obeyed the gospel, I, I, I talk about this a lot in my sermons. And, and when I talk about God and his eternal nature and in my Bible classes, I always try to warn people, you know, you can't ponder God's eternal nature. You cannot even ponder uh, heaven being eternal and living forever. There's no concept of it here in this realm. I guess the best way I can describe it is you just are. You just live. You're just here. But then again, that doesn't give us the answer. But God is eternal. I remember before I obeyed the gospel, back to that story. I remember trying to figure out, well, if God is God, who created God? And if that person created God, then who created him? And then my mind just went totally cuckoo. <laughs> and you might say, well, you're still cuckoo. Well, amen. That's okay with me. But God is eternal, and it's hard for us to comprehend that. And the easiest way to understand that is there is no other divine being except for God, and he's always existed. He's always existed in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now wrap your mind around that. And God is omnipotent. Now we use that word. That's a Bible. Uh, I shouldn't say it's a Bible word. The, the word is not found in the New Testament, but this is a church word. We always talk about God is omnipotent. Well, when we talk about this word, you can break it down. I like to simplify things. I appreciate Derek's prayer earlier. Because I was taught when you present the word of God, you present it in, in a way that everybody can understand from little Sally. And so when we talk about words, I want people to understand them. I don't want to stand up here and say, God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. You don't understand what in the world I'm saying. I want you to understand that, that God is omnipotent. Omni meaning all potent. Think of the word potent, powerful. He's all powerful. Omniscient. Omni meaning all science, meaning knowledge. He's got all knowledge. He's all knowing. And he's omnipresent. Omni meaning all and he's present everywhere. 
There's not a place you can go where God is not there. This is God, and we must understand who God is. God is eternal. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. I just want us to understand this simple point that God is not man. God is not man. God does not think like us. And I believe that's the problem with people in the religious world today. And I believe that's the problem with the world today is people try to say or they think in their mind that God thinks like us. Well, he does not think like us. And we're nothing like God. And that's why we are to conform to his image. We are com to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And we are to study his word. We are to study his will so we can be more like him. Why? Because we're not like God. Look at this passage here in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, just quickly. Uh, this is Balaam speaking to Balak, and it's just a quick point. I, I just want us to get the point that, look, God is not man. And Balaam is telling this to Balak. He says, God is not man. That he should lie. God doesn't lie. He's truthful, right? And that's why we can serve him. We can trust in the promises of God. God cannot lie. It's not in his character. It's impossible for God to lie nor a son of man, that is a human being, that he should repent. Look, nobody can counsel the mind of God. Nobody can tell God what to do. God can repent, meaning change his mind on his own, but no man can force God to change his mind on what God is going to do. Now, I understand in scriptures, sometimes we have people praying and they change God's uh, mind in that sense, but you cannot change God's eternal purpose. You cannot do that. And then he says, he has said, and he will not do it, or he has spoken, and will he not make it good? God is not man. He is the creator. We are the created. He is the potter. We are the clay. And once we recognize that, that God is God and, and we're created by him, we're created in his image, then we respond in reverence. And we worship God the way that he wants to be worshipped. And that's in spirit and in truth, John 4 and verse 24. We worship God in spirit and in truth. We worship God according to what the word of God says. And we give God our all, our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We serve God with everything that we have. And I wish people would understand this more. And I wish the world would understand this more, that God sets the standards. And, and I should say this, that we need to understand this more as Christians, that God sets the standards. And everything that we do in religious matters, we need to have book, chapter, and verse because he sets the standards. That hasn't changed, brethren. The world might change. Times might change, but God hasn't changed. And so we must always look to his word, for thus saith the Lord, and to worship him the way he wants to be worshipped. And that's when we show our faith. And that's when we say, God, you know what you're doing. God, we're listening to you. Out in the religious world, people don't understand that. Even the, in the church, people don't understand that. And people make statements like, you, well, you worship God the way you want to. I worship God the way I want to. And we're all going to heaven. I wish that was, but it's not. And that's the biggest lie the devil has ever told. Jesus responds back, or actually the scribe responds back, to Jesus. And the scribe said to him, right, teacher, you've answered right. You have truly stated that he is one. Now watch this. He's one God. And there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding. So what's your heart, your understanding, your intellect. And with all your strength. And to love one's neighbor as himself. Notice that the man didn't mention the soul. But again, the soul is included because that soul is you. That's your inner man. And we use it to worship God. Anyway, it is much more. Look at this. And I want to expound upon this and we'll close the lesson. It's much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And I like how Mark records. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, Jesus agreed with what he said. Jesus was responding and saying, yes, he answered correctly. He answered intelligent, intelligently. We'll come back to the last part of that verse when we close this lesson. What Jesus tells him. But I want you to notice the last part in verse 33. 
that to keep the greatest commandment is much better than burnt offerings and sacrifices. And, and why is that? Because it's showing your obedience to God. When you love God and you recognize who he is and you recognize him as the creator and you recognize that he sets the standards, you're going to obey that. And that's much better than offering and sacrifices. Again, Jesus is talking to a Jew under the law. And the, and the Jew responds back and says, yeah, these are better than the, the offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus said he's answered intelligently. The Jews, brethren, didn't truly grasp this concept under the old law. They didn't grasp the concept of obedience is better than sacrifice. Look at the book of Isaiah. Go, go to Isaiah chapter 1. And remember, Isaiah is prophesying to Judah and to the people of Jerusalem. And here you read chapter one. It, it's a very graphic uh, picture of Israel, excuse me, Ju uh, um, the southern kingdom's condition, Judah's condition and, and Jerusalem's condition. That they were in sin and the way that God describes how they look spiritually was terrible. You read the chapter in Isaiah chapter one. But the people thought that, well, we can please God in this way. We can be sinful. We can have other gods. And we'll just bring God all the sacrifices he wants and he'll be pleased. But watch what God says through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 1 and verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord of the word of Yahweh. You rulers of Sodom. Notice that he calls them the rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. He's saying they're so rotten they're so bad when it comes to sin that they're behaving like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah he says in verse 11 what are your multiplied sacrifices to me says the Lord who says Yahweh look they thought they you know here's what God wants we can keep living in a sinful condition we'll just keep bringing God's sacrifices and he'll forgive us and I will be pleasing to God but watch God's response I have enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle and take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me, new moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of uh, bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, look at this. I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with what? Blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the, the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. They didn't understand that concept. God wanted them to be obedient. God wanted them to serve him and him only. And what were they thinking? Well, we'll just bring God more sacrifices. And we'll keep keeping the festivals and we'll keep doing our religious ceremonies externally. And we'll keep praying to God and ask for his forgiveness. But God's saying, you need to clean up your heart. You need to be obedient and you need to respect me. He didn't want more sacrifices. God wants obedience. Listen to what the prophet Hosea said in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. For I delight in loyalty, obedience, rather than what? Sacrifice. And the knowledge of God rather than what? Burnt offerings. Because if you're obedient, you're not sinning. And if you have the knowledge of God recognizing who God is, you're not going to be sinning and you're not going to bring a burnt offering. Israel didn't understand that. They thought that if they can continue to sin and keep bringing God more sacrifices, he would be pleased with that. Now look at 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22. Now we all know the context here of Saul, King Saul, not Saul of Tarsus, but King Saul being disobedient to the commandment of God and sparing King Agag and, and sparing some of the flock and trying to keep the good things for himself and, and said he was going to sacrifice them to God, even though God gave the command through the prophet Samuel to destroy the Amalekites, to destroy the king and to keep nothing. And so remember, Saul said, I kept the will of God. I've been obedient to God. And here comes Samuel and Samuel corrects him 
And here's what Samuel tells him. And Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is what? Better than sacrifice. Saul, for some reason, thought if he can skip some of the commands that God gave, Sparing the king, taking back some of the goods. We can keep some of the goods for ourselves, but we're going to act like we're going to devote these to God. We'll just sacrifice these to God, and this will please God, and God will, will have mercy and compassion upon me, and he'll overlook my The prophet comes, Samuel tells him, you have disobeyed God. God doesn't care about your sacrifice. He cares about your heart. He wants you to be obedient. God wants the heart. Look at Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. This is a Psalm of David, a famous Psalm that we all know. When David writes this Psalm in remorse because of his sin that he committed with Bathsheba and having a man killed. And here's what he says. For thou dost not delight in sacrifice, or you do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise, I would give it. You are, thou art not pleased with burnt offering. But here's what God wants. The sacrifices of God are a what? Broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. David is saying, look, if I can have my sins covered of what I did for committing adultery and having a man killed, just bringing God a sacrifice, I'll do it. I'll be okay. And, and, and it will take care of my problem. But he's saying God wants obedience. God wants a repentant heart. He wants a penitent heart. And he wants us to recognize when we sin, when we, we fall short of his glory, he wants us to recognize we sin against him and we want to make things right with him. And we repent and try to do the right thing. God wants our heart. And lastly, friends, before we bring this lesson to a close, this greatest commandment to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength is not just saying, well, I love God and that's it. I have faith in God. It's faith only. It's that, that's not it. Look at James chapter 2 and verse 19. Here contextually when he starts talking about faith and works. Faith and works is talking about obedience. It's not talking about works of salvation, doing our own meritorious works. We know from the New Testament that we cannot do anything on our own in order to be saved. But when we become Christians, when we... Uh, clothe ourselves with Christ, God expects us to become like his son and God expects us to do his good works, his good works. And he uses us to do his good works. It's not us saying, I'm gonna work my way to heaven. No, it's saying, I, good Lord, I'm showing my appreciation for you. And Lord, I'm gonna do what you would have me to do. Remember, we're created uh, for good works in Christ Jesus, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter two. So this is not by faith only. And you say, well, how do you know that? Look at James 2 and verse 19. What does he say? You believe that God is what? One. There's one God. It's the greatest commandment to have one God and to love that one God. You do well. You'll do good. But watch this. The demons also believe in what? Shudder. See, demons know about the one true God. Demons know who Christ is. Demons know who the Father is. Demons know who the Holy Spirit is. And we see that throughout the Gospels. That when Jesus came near a person who was demon-possessed, the, the demons would cry out who Jesus was. And when the apostles, when they worked miracles, especially the apostle Paul, they knew exactly who Paul was, that he was preaching Jesus. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Remember the, the seven sons of, of Sceva who were trying to cast out uh, the demon and say, yeah, we, we, you know, we, we cast out demons by the, the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And remember how the demon responds. The demon man, the demon possessed man responds, beats the men up. <laughs> and so the demons know who God is. But what's the problem with the demons? There's no obedience. They're never going to obey. And we know from Matthew chapter 25 that the demon's faith is eternal damnation in hell. 
And we know the devil's fate is eternal damnation in hell. Why? Because he's a sinner. He's never going to repent. The demons are sinners. They're never going to repent. And so, brethren, this is not faith alone. In a nutshell, before we close the lesson, let's think about the greatest commandment again. The greatest commandment is to worship the one true God, to have one God. And again, we'll come back and talk about the one God being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself, or love your neighbor as yourself. If everybody would apply this, the world would be a better place. Politicians would be better, wouldn't they? World leaders would be better. Co-workers would be better. Neighbors would be better. This world will be better. Why? Because people would be walking in the fear of God. And people would understand that people are made in the image of God. That would do away with racism. People wouldn't have it in their mind just because somebody looks different or is of a different skin color. They hate them. They would say, look, people are made in the image of God, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity. It would do away with bigotry. It would do away with these terrible thinking that people have in the world. And brethren, let us have this attitude to recognize who God is and to worship him the way he wants to be worshiped and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, one quick thing I wanna to touch on before we're done. I think the problem is when it comes to people and ourselves not fulfilling this great commandment is yeah, we can love God, right? That's the easy part. I mean, you think about monks, what do they do? Well, they say they love God. They go out in the middle of nowhere and they chant all this, you know, humana hamana stuff. And they have no involvement with mankind. That's easy to do. Or we can just love our brethren and love the people who we love and the people who we agree with, we can, we can do that, right? We can love God and say, yeah, I love God. And then we can have a poor attitude towards our enemy or have a poor attitude towards people. That's the hard part, right? And I think that's because, I shouldn't say I think that's because, I, I know it's because, watch this. To love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And watch this, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love who? Yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to love that man in the mirror you look at every morning. And if you don't love yourself, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to treat others the way that you treat yourself. And if you have that low self-esteem, I'm not putting you down if you feel that. If you have that low self-esteem, recognize that you're made in the image of God. God is the one who created you in your mother's womb. You're a reflection of your father. You're a reflection of almighty God. And keep your head up. And the more you take care of this yourself, the more you're going to love other people. And you can bring people to the Lord that way. We'll close with this. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he agreed with what the man said. He said to him, watch this. You are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far. You're very close. You're very close. You're almost there. What's the man's problem? Why is he close to the kingdom of God? And why is he not following after Jesus? Why is he not a disciple of Christ? Because of his position. He's a scribe, he's a lawyer, he's a professional in the law. If he recognized who Jesus truly was, he would have followed after Jesus. He would have became a disciple of Jesus and he would have been in the kingdom of God. Now, we don't know what happens after this. Did he become a Christian and get saved later? I don't know. Did the man give up his position as a lawyer in the law? I, we don't know. But can you imagine if you're that lawyer and you're talking to Jesus, the master teacher, the eternal word, and Jesus responds and, and tells you, you're not far from the kingdom of God. That would stick in your mind, wouldn't it? If you were honest 
And every time you read the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, as that scribe, you would say, Jesus told me, that master teacher told me, I'm not far from the kingdom of God. Let's hope and pray that he obeyed the gospel. That's between him and God. And the man's been dead and gone for a long time. But the question for you this morning is, are you close to the kingdom of God? Are you very close? You know who God is. You know who Jesus is. You know who the spirit is. You, you know about his word, but you haven't truly obeyed the gospel. You have not been baptized into Christ. You're close to the kingdom of God. Maybe somebody taught you error, that all you needed to do was say the sinner's prayer. All you needed to do was have faith only. You know the truth, you're close, but you're not in the kingdom of God. And only way, the only way to get in the kingdom of God or to get into the church, the Lord has to add you to his church. Acts 2, verse 47, the Lord adds to the church. Acts 2, and verse 41, the 3,000 were added to the church. Hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as Lord by being baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, he will add you to his church. Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And again, we learn that the 3,000 were uh, added to the church. Acts 2 verse 41 and verse 47. If there's anybody here who needs to respond to the gospel, let that be known. Or if you've been living a life of sin and you need to confess your faults with one another, uh, let that be known. And thank you so much for uh, listening to me this morning. I went a little over 41 minutes, but uh, hopefully next time um, I'll keep it a little bit shorter. But I'll leave it there. Thank you so much.